My name is Joe Bellick, and I'm the founding partner of the Law Offices of Bellick & Fox. We support the mesothelioma community by providing first quality legal representation to mesothelioma patients and their families. During these troubling times, we're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation so they can continue the work that they do every day on behalf of mesothelioma patients and their families. My name is Kelly Batley. My name is Clay Thompson. My name is Neil Mowney. We are MRHFM, a national firm with 70 attorneys and 11 offices across the U.S. At MRHFM, we exclusively help mesothelioma patients and their families. It's all we do. This is why we are proud to sponsor the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation and its work to fund mesothelioma research and provide support services and education for patients and their families. At NovaCure, we strive to extend survival in some of the most aggressive forms of cancer through the development and commercialization of our innovative therapy called tumor treating fields. NovaCure is pleased to partner again with the Meso Foundation. Dr. Blakely, thank you very much for being willing to join us on our latest episode of Meso TV. Uh, I know you're a surgeon. You practice at the National Cancer Institute, National in uh, Institute of Health. Could you um, introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about, you know, your background and um, your interests at the uh, National Cancer Institute? Sure. And first, thank you very much for having me. It, it's a real honor to, to be able to talk to you more about um, my work here so far at the NIH and, and what I hope to do in the future. So a little bit about me, I had done my residency training in Rhode Island before doing my fellowship out at City of Hope in California. At City of Hope, it was a unique situation in that we had a very close interaction with gynecologic oncologists and we had a very busy surgical oncology program for peritoneal surface malignancies. And so uh, a lot of my clinical volume and fellowship and a lot of my interests aligned with peritoneal surface malignancies, including peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, mm -hmm. I started here at the NIH in September of 2019, and um, my areas of clinical and research interest include mesothelioma and other peritoneal malignancies, as well as sarcomas such as gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Focusing more on the peritoneal surface malignancies, what we're looking at is developing protocols for um, improved treatment directed towards the peritoneal cavity, either ahead of, during, or after cytoreductive surgery. And so for peritoneal mesothelioma uh, specifically, uh, areas of, of interest would be uh, evaluating different regimens for heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and then looking at other sorts of regional treatments, whether through immunotherapy or something of the like. Thank you. So, you know, I have a question, as you said, that, you know, you were involved with the uh, gynecologic um, oncology groups as well. Mm -hmm. Why is there so much difficulty in the initial diagnosis of peritoneal mesothelioma that so many women are diagnosed first with ovarian, may go through some ovarian, you know, regimens before, you know, they, they come to the conclusion that this was actually a peritoneal mesothelioma? Uh, that's a great question. It's a question we also face with appendiceal cancer. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of it comes down to the pathology review. A lot of it comes down to the quality of the tissue that's being evaluated and just the expertise of the person who's obtaining that tissue as far as uh, identifying the ideal areas to biopsy and providing a good sample. And so it's a very common story that the patients are misdiagnosed initially before ultimately getting that pathology review and coming to that final diagnosis. And so this is a story mm -hmm. I've heard time and again. So do you think it also has something to do with, um, you know, uh, many times people with mesothelioma will evidence high levels of CA-125, mm -hmm. and there's sort of a natural prejudice to think it's an ovarian because that's a, you know, a, an approved marker for ovarian, but something we follow in mesothelioma, but not really an approved marker. Absolutely. 
Absolutely, and I think that tumor markers are very patient specific in the sense that sometimes they're not very good markers and sometimes they're misleading when they're elevated. And so it's certainly not 100% specific to ovarian cancer and we see this with mesothelioma and other types of cancers as well. Um, and I also think that some people will look at peritoneal mesothelioma as more of a diagnosis of exclusion to say that the common things are mm -hmm. common and people commonly see ovarian cancer. And we, again, we have that, that, um, that disconnect with appendiceal cancer, and I think mesothelioma is certainly right up there. I think the other aspect that's interesting with mesothelioma is that similar to ovarian cancer, it does tend to have a little bit more of a sensitivity to the immune system. And so mm -hmm. I think the interest, particularly with the recent FDA approval for pleural mesothelioma of immunotherapy, will soon be extended to peritoneal mesothelioma, just like with ovarian cancer. Um, and so I think that there are some similarities that we see between mesothelioma and ovarian cancer that are stronger than with other sorts of cancers that go to the peritoneal cavity that help to lead to that um, confusing of the two uh, in many cases. Mm -hmm. So. Um also earlier, you mentioned about an interest in uh, high pec and the high pec regimen. So, you know, I know that we are sort of in a morass with so many different regimens. Mm -hmm. There really has never been a standardization of treatment of um, of, um, of peritoneal mesothelioma, despite you know, besides high pec and you know, just a mix mash of various centers. So, what's your thoughts on that, and how do we get to the point where maybe we would have something that would be more standardized? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that in a lot of centers around the country, um, uh, cisplatin monotherapy is what's often offered. And there's no evidence to say that that's inferior to anything else. Um, there was some you know, pretty good retrospective data, so not the, not the gold standard randomized clinical trial, mm -hmm. but at least some suggestion that uh, second agents in addition to cisplatin might lead to additional benefit. And so, um, so far what I've done is, is pair the cisplatin with doxorubicin and mm -hmm. we have a planned HIPEC trial coming up. Um, and for the ovarian and peritoneal mesothelioma primaries, the, the patients would be randomized to cisplatin with doxorubicin or cisplatin with mitomycin. There's been no mm -hmm. superiority shown between doxorubicin and mitomycin. And I think the standard of care is cisplatin, so I would, I would not want to withhold that. Uh, but I, I agree, it's kind of an open-ended question right now. Um, mm -hmm. The difficulty, I think, with peritoneal mesothelioma and other peritoneal malignancies is the design of the trials to really prove that one is better than the other is difficult. Because a lot of times mm -hmm. we're not looking at radiographic criteria you know, as far as the size of a lesion within the liver, or the lung. Um, and so it is harder to judge that. And I think that other trials that have, that have come out in this area, there's often conflicting trials on each side to say that this regimen is better than the other, but then you have trials supporting the opposite. And so I, I think mm -hmm. it is dif difficult, but based on the best evidence I think we have at hand, at least saying that two agents is better than one, has some likely merit to it. Mm -hmm. So you're in the process of designing this trial and uh, it's, not, it's not approved yet, but um, if it's a randomized trial and this is such a rare disease, um, for statistical analysis, how many patients will you need to accrue? Has that been decided yet? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's, it's um, essentially a phase one trial but it is offering mm -hmm. standard of care surgery and standard of care chemotherapy. And so it's mm -hmm. the same treatment as um, patients would receive in other centers, maybe with very slight modifications, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, you know, we're not sacrificing the quality of the cytoreduction or of the HIPEC for the scientific mm -hmm. goals. Um, what it will call for is it has four histologies, including peritoneal mesothelioma, ovarian cancer, appendiceal cancer, and colorectal cancer that have spread to the peritoneal cavity. Um, and it'll be a 40 patient trial. What we're looking for is 10 patients in the peritoneal mesothelioma arm and five mm -hmm. 
would be ran of the 10, they'd be randomized. So ideally five patients would undergo the cisplatin plus mitomycin and five patients would have the cisplatin plus doxorubicin. Mm -hmm. The main scientific goal of the trial is we have a, a lab-based platform. And what we're able to do is take peritoneal tumors, harvest them and put them in the system and keep them alive for several days. This allows mm -hmm. us to study how the tumors react to changes in, uh, in environment or even to exposure to chemotherapy. And mm -hmm. what we'll do is take some of these tumor nodules early on in the surgery, put them in the system and simulate the same HIPEC treatment in this system. You know, mm -hmm. the same temperature, uh, heating and the same relative dose of the chemotherapy as the patient would receive. Mm -hmm. The patient, meanwhile, would have their cytoreductive surgery and have the HIPEC that they were, you know, one of those two treatments mm -hmm. that they were randomized to. What we're looking to see is if this system can replicate what's happening to the patient's tumor tissue in the operating room. Mm -hmm. And if that system is able to demonstrate, you know, similar effects on the tissue with exposure to this chemotherapy, I think this would be a major step for us to be able to start saying that we can personalize high pec treatment to a patient's individual tumor. And that's mm -hmm, what I think mm -hmm. we've all wanted to get towards. I think other models have fallen short because when we look at just cell culture with cells on plastic, they react differently, they behave differently than when they do mm -hmm. inside the body. And when we look at mm -hmm. other things like organoids, a lot of times those cancer cells have been processed and the organoids consist only of the cancer cells. And so you mm -hmm. lose that interaction of the cancer cells with their environment. And the same can be said with, with mouse models. Is that when we take patients' mm -hmm. tumor cells and put them into mice, we don't have the same immune system as mice do. And so sometimes mm -hmm. what we see happening to the mouse doesn't translate to what we see in people. And mm -hmm. we're, we think that by being able to preserve that environment of these tumor nodules, mm -hmm. expose them to chemotherapy and study the response, we think that's gonna have a, a better correlation to what actually happens to tumor cells in patients during mm -hmm. high mm -hmm. Yeah, cause I mean, that goes along with when we talk about bystander cells, et cetera, that there's that whole micro environment where they're interacting. Absolutely. Uh, so this really would lead us to a more personalized approach then um, yes. that, you know, as we move forward, different drugs and, mm -hmm. you know, as we see new, uh, new things come into the clinic, you know, particularly immunotherapy. So right. are you going to be looking at all histologies or, you know, uh, who would you take into this clinical trial? So the, the criteria are, are pretty loose in the sense that we want mm -hmm. histologic confirmation and basically to feel mm -hmm. that we can achieve a complete cytoreduction. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to put anybody through a surgery where we didn't think that we could achieve that cytoreduction reduction because then the high pec isn't of as much benefit. Um, mm -hmm. There is some data to say that even in an incomplete cytoreduction, reduction, the high pec can be beneficial. But I think that even in peritoneal mesothelioma, that's where there's a role for neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy or even immunotherapy mm -hmm. to try and downstage and facilitate that surgery afterwards. Um, right. But aside mm -hmm. from that, the, the criteria are, are pretty wide open. We don't, and the only other thing would just be to say no disease outside of the abdomen. But for peritoneal mm -hmm. mesothelioma, generally speaking, that should not be a problem. So will you be accepting biphasic and sarcomatoid patients or just epithelial? That's, that's a great question. I haven't specified um, mm -hmm. the, the subtype uh, histologically of peritoneal mesothelioma. I think mm -hmm. that it, it's a very good question. Um, I think we tend to find that the epithelioid subtype does better with the cytoreduction reduction and the high pec. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I think that with a sarcomatoid or biphasic, they, those patients often also respond a little bit better to the systemic therapies. And so I think that somebody with mm -hmm. a sarcomatoid or biphasic histology who undergoes a neoadjuvant therapy of some kind, whether it's immunotherapy or chemotherapy, has a good response, then I think that mm -hmm. that would be somebody I would certainly consider for inclusion. Mm -hmm. Great, good. So, I mean, this is, you know, we had started excluding biphasic and sarcomatoid for many years, but 
you know, I know when I look back at, you know, some of the data we had collected many years ago, we found that with repeated chemotherapies, our sarcomatoid patients remained without evidence of disease, but when we stopped, they relapsed. So perhaps the debulking, and right. then if and you know, when they relapse, they still are, you know, have less disease burden than they had before, perhaps the institution of uh, immunotherapy or you know, something novel at that time really can, can extend survival in patients with, you know, uh, you know, with a more aggressive histology. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so the work of the NIH and CI has always been um, to focus on rare diseases and mesothelioma is a rare disease. So could you tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, how this institution functions, um, you know, because, you know, people think it's an institute. What does an institute mean versus going to a regular practice? Sure. That's a great question. I think that one of the, the main benefits is that we have multiple um, physicians and teams and investigators who are looking at different diseases from different aspects. And I think that one of the things that makes the NCI and the NIH unique is that there's been a long-standing multidisciplinary approach to mesothelioma care here. And I think that collaborating with folks such as Dr. Hassan and Dr. Shrump from medical oncology and thoracic oncology is very helpful because a lot of times mm -hmm. we, we need to be able to provide a complete system of care. And so patients who have mm -hmm. bicompartmental or tricompartmental disease are able to be evaluated and treated in sequence all in-house here. And, and they tend to be some of the more challenging patients to take care of and decide which compartment mm -hmm. do we address first and what sequence mm -hmm. And, and how do we go about coordinating that care? Um, but I also think there's some novel investigations here. And I think two good examples uh, I would provide. One is that there's a, a big interest here in um, learning more about BAP1 mutations. And mm -hmm. as, as we found uh, BAP1 predisposes patients to pleural mesothelioma and peritoneal mesothelioma and renal cell carcinoma. Uh, our urology group here is incredibly interested in familial types of renal cell carcinoma, uh, including from mm -hmm. BAP1. And I think that, again, it's another example of just how multiple disciplines have come together to figure out how can we best care for these patients. And mm -hmm. Dr. Shrump has a protocol that's uh, just recently up and running, looking at mm -hmm. active surveillance of BAP1 patients and following them with serial uh, thoracoscopy on each side, as well as laparoscopy, in order to detect at an early stage, follow and decide when to intervene on any pleural or peritoneal mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one aspect that I think is unique. And I think it's about 15% of patients with peritoneal mesothelioma will have a BAP1 mutation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's a substantial number of patients. Um, and I think this surveillance trial will allow us to learn more about the disease biology and how it compares to non-BAP1 mesothelioma, and also mm -hmm. better refine guidelines as far as when to intervene um, and recommend something like a pleurectomy decortication or cytoreduction in HIPEC. Another Thank you. And do you think that, oh, I'm sorry, just, just a quick question. Do you think patients with peritoneal mesothelioma, all, all comers, uh, should they be checked for a germline mutation since 15% seems to be a rather high number? I would say yes. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that we, as, as a field in surgical oncology and oncology in general, we've shifted more towards routine germline testing. And I think that it's important um, because sometimes we'll find uh, mutations that maybe didn't have a clinical significance years ago, but we're learning more and more. And a lot of these panels have expanded incredibly in the last five to 10 years to include a lot, a, a much wider range of mutations. Um, I think that certainly the thing to clue us in for that is the, on the histology specimen to see the loss of BAP1 versus preservation mm -hmm. of BAP1. That is, is an easy trigger for us to see that, you know, perhaps a patient with the loss of BAP1 function should undergo subsequent germline testing. There isn't necessarily mm -hmm. uh, a well-defined age range. Um, 
the trial, for example, calls for anybody age 30 or older to undergo this mm -hmm. active surveillance with the thoracoscopy and laparoscopy. Um, but again, mm -hmm. we're still learning um, how exactly this that BAP1 associated disease behaves compared to non BAP1. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about what a thoracoscopy and um, wh what it actually is? Sure. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with the laparoscopy since that's the part that okay. I'm mm -hmm. performing. And mm -hmm. generally, it's, it's an outpatient type procedure. Um, and what we do is use two, maybe three small incisions to uh, blow up the abdomen and take a look around. And what we do is we focus on certain areas where we know that mesothelioma and other peritoneal malignancies tend to collect. And that's up on the, the right diaphragm over the liver, down in the pelvis, um, and also along the omentum and along the small intestine. And what it does is it provides a good survey of the entire abdominal cavity. We can't get a, as, you know, as complete a picture as if we were to perform an open surgery, um, but it gets us a very good idea as far as how much disease relatively a patient might have. And that helps us mm -hmm. decide if and when to recommend a cytoreduction and the HIPEC. For the thoracoscopy, what that requires is generally a uh, special breathing tube that has two chambers, one for each lung, and the patient's laid on the, the opposite side of the lung that's going to be evaluated. And again, mm -hmm. with usually two or three small incisions between the ribs, then we're able to take a survey of the pleural cavity or the lining around the lung on each side. So if we were to do this all together, um, that would probably be something that patients may want to stay overnight following this procedure, but we mm -hmm. could perform the laparoscopy and the thoracoscopy on each side in probably about two hours or so. Um, and again, it'd be just several small incisions, but um, you know, I think it's uh, generally pretty easy uh, operation to undergo and recover from. Right, and because it is the NIH NCI, um, you're able to do things without having to get insurance involved. Um, things are care is provided free of charge. So, you know, early intervention, early exploration um, can possibly lead to save lives. So, Absolutely. you know, I think it's uh, an important, you know, very important the work that you're doing. Yeah, I think yeah. The only costs that aren't covered necessarily are travel, and so that's the mm -hmm. only thing. And I think that. Your organization has been really instrumental in, in helping um, with assistance with travel when needed. Um, but aside from that, once the patient's here, then as you said, all the care is uh, free of charge. The only times we ever have to really get insurance involved would be after a more extensive surgery if the patient were to require anything like a rehab or um, tube feeds or some sort of nutrition after discharge. But anything provided here Absolutely, we don't need to involve uh, the insurance companies. And I think that's an important thing, mm -hmm. particularly because I've had several patients who have said they can't get repeat laparoscopies because a lot of times insurance mm -hmm. providers won't approve a second laparoscopy in less than a year since the last one. Um, whereas here, if somebody were to need uh, a laparoscopy every six months, uh, I think it'd be a pretty extreme case, but to be fair, we could do that and no one would ask any questions. Wonderful, which is great. I mean, you know, when you can push assured insurance aside and do what you think is right for a patient, it's uh, so important. So this is coming from just a completely different aspect of the disease, but, you know, so many young women are diagnosed with peritoneal mesothelioma. So what are your thoughts on fertility preservation, uh, fertility counseling? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a, a critical component of caring for a patient. Uh, and really kind of from a holistic approach. Um, we collaborate with uh, the group from Walter Reed for anything mm -hmm. to do with um, egg cell preservation and storage. Uh, and that's something we are happy to offer in consultation for anybody who's interested. And I think it's particularly important for patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. One thing that we know from studying things like gastric cancer and appendiceal cancer is that the ovaries by virtue of sitting in the pelvis often are secondarily involved with cancer. And we see that very commonly with gastric cancer with so-called Krukenberg tumors. Um, 
And you know, for years, appendiceal cancer was mistaken as ovarian cancer just because a lot of the mucin produced by the appendix ends up infiltrating the ovaries. And mm -hmm. so removal of the ovaries as a component of a cytoreductive surgery is very common. And I think that anticipating that ahead of surgery and providing the counseling and resources needed for fertility preservation is very important because sometimes in order to clear the pelvis of disease in the best way possible, it's not just removing the ovaries, but also the uterus. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that these decisions can't be taken lightly. Um, and these are, are very important parts of treating the disease. But I think from the patient perspective, absolutely the fertility preservation uh, considerations are, are really important. Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, and I've never looked at the NIH to see, you know, um, post these surgical procedures if, uh, you know, if you, if, and I don't know if you would know this either, if um, they're studying IVF and, uh, and you know, patients who've had a prior history of cancer. Um, but I think that's sure. a resource that we should probably look at because, you know, when we think of these uh, peritoneal patients and we think of so many of them are long-term survivors and are diagnosed at a young age. Um, perhaps have you know lost their fertility, but are very interested in having children. Um, it's it's expensive. Um, so if we could find you know a center or a site that you know is exploring this um, at no cost to the patient or insurance, uh, I think that's something that um, you know I, I've never had a conversation about with uh, with anyone at the NIH. But perhaps mm -hmm. it's a conversation we should open. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, no. I think it's very reasonable, mm -hmm. and so I, I think mm -hmm. there is a. a Really interesting question and something that we'll definitely have to look into. Thank you. And before we end, end the interview, I, I just have another uh, question for you. So, you know, patients who've had HIPEC um, have done well with it, and then the disease has come back. Are they always candidates for HIPEC, or are there other unique ways that we might treat the disease? I mean, of course, depending on, you know, the location, amount, et cetera. All right. I think that's, that's an excellent question. That brings me to the other area of investigation. Um, there's a lot of interest uh, here at the NIH in using uh, what's called an immunotoxin. And what it does is it targets um, tumors that express a protein called mesothelin. And we see that mesothelin is expressed in mesothelioma, as well as other cancers like gastric cancer. Mm -hmm. And so another protocol that's in the works right now with Dr. Schrump is looking to use this immunotoxin in order to perfuse a patient's chest after they've undergone uh, surgery for recurrent pleural mesothelioma. And mm -hmm. this is something I've talked about with uh, Dr. Schrump, as well as the developer of the immunotoxin, um, uh, Ira Pastin. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interest in using this for peritoneal mesothelioma as well. And so mm -hmm. the current concept and how this protocol would be designed, um, and again, it's in the design stages, so we're a little ways away, but um, what we're considering doing is using it in two ways. So for patients who present for the initial cytoreduction and HIPEC to undergo that standard treatment, but then potentially um, leave a catheter and infuse the immunotoxin into the peritoneal cavity in the early days after surgery, before discharge. Mm -hmm. And the other mm -hmm. is to potentially use the immunotoxin instead of HIPEC following a repeat cytoreduction. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably of more interest to the patients who have recurrent disease because depending mm -hmm. on how much time has passed between the initial cytoreduction and HIPEC and the recurrence, it may make sense to redo the HIPEC if it's been several years but if it's been only one, two, or three years since the, mm -hmm. the first HIPEC, then arguably a different approach to the treatment probably makes more sense. And this mm -hmm. is where instead of chemotherapy in the perfusion, what we're looking at is the stability of this immunotoxin to perfuse it at the elevated temperatures in a HIPEC type fashion. But we think that the immunotoxin's greatest effect and greatest benefit is following a cytoreduction when the amount of disease is as low as possible. And in this mm -hmm. way, it, it primes the immune system to target these cells that express 
the mesothelium. So it's a slightly different approach to immunotherapy than what we might see on TV as far as Opdivo and Keytruda, but it has a similar kind of concept in order to very specifically target these malignant cells using this immunotoxin. And so I'm hoping that by the end of this year, this is something that we have up and running. Um, Dr. Shrump is doing a lot of the legwork as far as determining the stability and, and kind of kinetics of how this immunotoxin mm -hmm. would work in the pleural cavity, which we can then extrapolate to the abdominal cavity and design this trial where we would be able to treat both patients who are coming for the initial cytoreduction as well as for those who have recurrent disease. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess one area of concern would be, you know, the development of fibrosis, you know, scar tissue that would prevent, you know, the a full perfusion through the abdomen. Is there mm -hmm. any work being done to see if, if we can prevent or at least slow down this, uh, this formation of scar tissue in those patients? That's a very good question. And I'm not aware of, of anything at the moment. I think that mm -hmm. we're probably still mostly focused on figuring out how to best eradicate the disease and, and, mm -hmm. you know, prolong um, the basically survival and, and optimize the benefit mm -hmm of the surgery and the, and the chemotherapy. As far as the prevention of the fibrosis, I think that's that's an interesting point that you raise and, and something that's, I would say, probably under-investigated. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much for this conversation. I think um, we've given everyone a lot of information. Is there anything I haven't asked that you'd like to discuss? Um, not necessarily. I think you covered a lot of, of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I would like to say that um, even though the HIPEC trial isn't currently up and running, I'm more than happy mm -hmm. to talk to patients um, who are looking for a second opinion or a third opinion, and I'm happy to review anybody's case and, and render an opinion. And also, we, cannot, we can still provide care here, even if it's not on an active clinical trial protocol, but under a standard of care, um, we have a protocol for that. And so, you know, I think that um, we're happy to help in any way possible. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And I know we'll have some follow-up with you. And, um, you know, we're thinking of maybe um, planning to have some opportunities for some of our leading researchers and physicians to meet with patients uh, and answer some uh, questions directly. So that'll be in the works at some point. And thank you again. Uh, appreciate the time. Of course. Thank Take you care. very much for having me. I, I really enjoyed this.